Much can be learned about a matrix by putting it in row echelon or reduced row echelon form. In this video, we'll introduce those forms, see some examples and non-examples, and briefly cover Gaussian and Gauss-Jordan elimination. Beginning with row echelon form. To be in row echelon form, a matrix must have these three properties. Any row that doesn't consist entirely of zeros has to have one as its first non-zero entry. So if a row does consist entirely of zeros, that's fine, but otherwise its first non-zero entry has got to be 1. Secondly, any of the rows that do consist entirely of zeros must be below all of the other rows. They've got to be at the bottom of the matrix. And finally, in any two successive rows that don't consist entirely of zeros, the leading one in the lower row must occur further to the right than the leading one in the higher row. Thus, the leading ones have to follow this sort of descending staircase pattern. Each one occurs further to the right than the one above it. With those properties covered, here are four matrices. Look at each one and determine whether or not it's in row echelon form. Beginning with this first one, is it in row echelon form? The answer is no, because we see this leading one, which actually occurs to the left of a leading one that is above it. That's not allowed in row echelon form. This one would have to occur further to the right than the one above it. So this matrix is not in row echelon form. What about this one? This one is not in row echelon form either. It violates property one. We have this row here, which doesn't consist entirely of zeros, but its first non-zero entry isn't one, it's two. For it to be in row echelon form, this first non-zero entry would have to be one. It's worth mentioning that some textbooks and authors don't actually require property one for row echelon form matrices, but we will in our course. Just be aware whatever definition you need to use. Then we have this green matrix. Is this in row echelon form? The answer is yes. The zero row is at the bottom. Each row that does not consist of zeros has one as its leading entry, and each leading one occurs further to the right than the leading one above it. Finally, this fourth matrix is this in row echelon form. The answer again is yes. There's a row of zeros, but it occurs at the bottom as required, and each of the leading ones occurs further to the right than the leading one above it. So of course, some matrices are in row echelon form and some are not, but every matrix can be transformed into row echelon form by a sequence of elementary row operations through a process called Gaussian elimination. I'll leave a link in the description to a video where we go over Gaussian elimination in detail. I'll just give you a brief overview here. So typically, Gaussian elimination on a matrix will be done to solve a system of linear equations. Consider this system of linear equations here. We can represent it as a matrix like this, where each column is storing the coefficients of a particular variable. Column 1 has the coefficients of x1, column 2 has the coefficients of x2, and so on. And we have a vertical line here which separates the coefficients from these numbers which are storing the constants from the system of equations. Note how each row corresponds to one of the equations in the system. Of course, it's not clear what the solution to this system is from the three equations, and it's also not clear from this matrix what the solution is. But if we put this matrix into row echelon form, it will actually be very easy to find the solution to the system. To put the matrix in row echelon form, we can use what are called elementary row operations. There are three such operations. You can multiply a row by a non-zero scalar, you can swap two rows, or you can add a multiple of one row to another. To begin putting this matrix in row echelon form, the first two things we might do is add row 1 to row 2. That way, we would turn this negative 1 into a 0 by adding row 1 to row 2. Adding 1 to negative 2 would give us negative 1. Adding 2 to 3 would give us 5, and adding 8 to 1 would give us 9. We'd also want to make this 3 a 0, so we would subtract 3 copies of row 1 from row 3. 
Thus, we'd have 3 minus 3 times 1, giving us 0. We'd have negative 7 minus 3 times 1, giving us negative 10. We'd have 4 minus 3 times 2, that's 4 minus 6, giving us negative 2. And we'd have 10 minus 3 times 8, giving us negative 14. We're trying to introduce zeros below this leading one so that our next leading one occurs further to the right. We continue in this way, performing elementary row operations until we get a matrix in row echelon form. Again, more details on this Gaussian elimination in my video linked in the description. But once we're in row echelon form, this matrix corresponds to a system of equations which can easily be used to find the solution to the original system. All of the row operations that we performed are just like the things we might do while performing elimination on this system of equations. We see from row 3 that x3 must equal 2. We can then plug that in to the equation that comes from row 2. Row 2 tells us that x2 minus 5x3 equals negative 9, but we know x3 equals 2. So this is actually minus 10, and so we have that x2 equals positive 1. We can then plug our known values for x3 and x2 into the equation corresponding to row 1 and solve that for x1. So that's why this row echelon form is useful. Once we get the matrix into row echelon form, the system of equations that it represents can easily be solved. It's worth noting that this matrix is different from this one. They are different matrices. This one is not in row echelon form. This one is in row echelon form. And even though this was obtained from this, they are definitely different. But there's a lot they have in common, which is why this row echelon form can be so useful. In particular, in this example, what they have in common is that the solution to the system of equations represented by this is the same as the solution to the system of equations represented by that. Now let's talk about reduced row echelon form. This is the same as row echelon form with one additional rule, which is that each column containing a leading one must have zeros in all of its other entries. If we look back at some of our row echelon matrices, for example, this one, here we have a leading one, and you can see there are non-zero numbers in that column. That's fine for row echelon form, but it wouldn't be allowed in reduced row echelon form. So let's look at these four matrices and determine which is in reduced row echelon form and which is not. This first matrix is in reduced row echelon form. We've got these leading ones. Each one occurs further to the right than the one above it. So it is in row echelon form. And each column that contains a leading one has zeros everywhere else. So this is in reduced row echelon form. What about this matrix in red? This one is not in reduced row echelon form. It's not even in row echelon form because of this leading entry that is not one. If this leading entry was one, it still wouldn't be in reduced row echelon form because this column contains a leading one, but it doesn't have zeros everywhere else because it has this three. This green matrix is in reduced row echelon form. The columns that contain the leading ones have zeros everywhere else. There's this column that doesn't contain a leading one, and so it doesn't have to have zeros everywhere else. Finally, this matrix is also in reduced row echelon form. Again, notice how this column has a negative two, but that's not an issue because this column doesn't contain a leading one. If it did have a leading one, it would have to have zeros everywhere else, like this column. This column column has a leading one, and so it has zeros everywhere else. But again, this matrix is in reduced row echelon form. If these two rows were swapped, just as a counterexample, it would not be in reduced row echelon form because rows of zeros are required to be at the bottom. But if we get that row of zeros down to the bottom, then it is now in reduced row echelon form. Just like row echelon form, every matrix can be transformed into reduced row echelon form by a similar process using elements entry row operations, and this is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. And again, it would typically be used to solve a system of linear equations. This is the same system as before, which we can represent with a matrix like this. We could perform Gaussian elimination, and thus we would stop at this row echelon form. 
But if we continue working with this matrix until we get it into reduced row echelon form, that's Gauss-Jordan elimination. To get this into reduced row echelon form, we need to introduce zeros above those leading ones. Because remember, if a column contains a leading one, it has to have zeros everywhere else. So those are the row operations we would perform until finally arriving here with the matrix in reduced row echelon form. And it's clear at a glance what the solution to the system is from this matrix. X3 is equal to two, X2 is equal to one, and X1 is equal to three. This of course agrees with the solution that we found using Gaussian elimination, x1 is 3, x2 is 1, and x3 is 2. So either method works. When we put the matrix into reduced row echelon form, we just do a little bit more of the work with the matrices, and so the solutions pretty much pop out as soon as we're done. If we just use the row echelon form, there's a little bit more work that we have to do to finish solving. So that's what row echelon and reduced row echelon forms are, and a little bit about why they're important. Again, you can see the difference between them right in these two two matrices. This one's in row echelon form, but it's not in reduced row echelon form because these leading ones have non-zero numbers above them. To get the matrix into reduced row echelon form, we get zeros above those leading ones, and then we get here. This is in reduced row echelon form because each leading one has zeros everywhere else in its column. And of course, all the other rules are satisfied as well, so that's in reduced row echelon form. That is just in row echelon form. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my Linear Algebra course and Linear Algebra Exercises playlists in the description for more. And if you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to additional videos and extra practice. And if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes used in my courses. Thanks for watching. <laughs>